Henry Harrison was the ninth president, and that's the grandfather of this man. This uh, this man was elected in 1888. As a matter of fact, July 4th, 1888, was the day he accepted the nomination. So the home was uh, built and opened in 1875. That's a common question. How old is the house? 143 years. Mr. Harrison had it built. He didn't build it himself, but he had it contracted out. So this was his home for the rest of his life. He died upstate in 1901. In the meantime, he was a United States Senator, so he lived in Washington. Of course, he was president for four years in Washington, but he kept the home. And he came back here after his political career. The home is very original. This is the, uh, this is the house. Uh, the Harrison family is the only family to own this house. Now, that, that really means a lot because most homes of this era have been, have been through a number of ownerships. And uh, uh, we're going to let these folks come in. Come on in, folks. There you are. It's sticking now, yeah. I guess. Well, it's, welcome to the home of our 23rd president, Benjamin Harrison. The home opened in 1875. What I was trying to say, what does it mean if I tell you that nobody else owns this house? Well, it, it, in a way, it is owned by a nonprofit now. But what happens to homes of this era? Percent of the furnishings belong to Benjamin Harrison. Everything, almost everything in the front part is Benjamin Harrison. So it's really a unique presidential site. We ask you uh, not to pick anything up. Don't sit in the chairs. Don't touch anything. And you may take pictures if you can turn off the flash. And so, welcome to the home of our 23rd president. I have a, I have a feeling he's going to win. But right now, he's just a candidate for president, right? Yeah. So it's General Harrison. I'm going to usher you back to the rear part here. Follow me. You can go ahead. Oh, I'm going to look in that room. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, gosh. All right. That's Benjamin Harrison. This is this is not a real rug that was here. That was something we put down to sort of duplicate what would have been here in the first place. Of course, Jim told you about our rug in here. I think that that's a real one. Probably could use some cleaning, but outside of that, so and this lighting fixture and that one are the only two originals in the house. We've lost some dangles. And they have changed the globe at one time or another, but that was the original uh, gas light. And if you know anything about them, there would have been a key that comes down from here, and you turn the key, and then that lights it up. I've been told that people who owned a house across the street that looks very much like this one, a couple years ago, they put gas lighting in so when they had a party they could light up the gas lighting i don't know if it's the same family or not over there but they have done a lot of renovations so it's a beautiful house and uh, our house looks very much the way it does in a way when benjamin harrison lived here because when the second mrs harrison i'll tell you about her a little bit sold the house she made sure that she found somebody who lived up to her agreement, and that was, this is Benjamin Harrison's home. Nothing was to be changed that would destroy the character of the house. You couldn't knock out walls, anything <laughs> over woodwork, anything like that. So it's got the original shutters, original floors, original doors, original hardware, all kinds of good stuff like that. So when you walk into it, and plus that, we found, you know, Jim told you about him running for president in the, actually in this room in 1888, they nominated him. And so photographers went through and they took pictures of the house because even though you couldn't publish pictures, you could do engravings. So I'm gonna show you one here. Now I can pick this up and touch it because it's just a dime store frame. But if you take one good look at this, notice the ceiling. See? Notice the wallpaper and the border. 
Now the wallpaper is slightly different because we couldn't figure out what that was, but we knew what the other one pretty much looked out. And the person who did this, she made a big and great enlargement of the whole thing so they could do this. And then they hand screened every piece of this. And as the gentleman who did this said, he had, I don't know how many pieces of paper in here, he said that he had that many times to screw it up because since it's hand screened, every color is separate as he went through. They did a beautiful job, as you can tell. But sometimes when the guys were in here hanging the paper, because you see, we were doing tours through here at the same time. All the wallpaper was down and everything else, which was kind of fun because you'd find all kinds of handwriting on the wall. There's one big one right across here that was from like 1870 or something like that. We couldn't really make it out, so every group of school children that came through, we asked them if they could decipher us. And I think some of them did a pretty good job of figuring out what it was. Of course, they made a picture of it before we, got, we put the wallpaper up on the whole thing. Okay. But we're kind of proud of, what it looked, of the Tippecanoe Committee who actually nominated his grandfather for president were here at the time. Can you imagine 40 years difference in time? But somebody said these men must have been pretty doddering by that time. But they were all here, and he was standing right here, and they all lined up there, um, asked him if he would accept the nomination. Of course, uh, it got out ahead of time. Did you see the picture of the welcome center of him standing on his court stoop? And all these people down there, he was trying to get home real fast to let his wife know so she would not be surprised. He got home to find out the whole yard was full of people because they had to be found out ahead of time. And everybody had to carry off a souvenir of some sort of a momentous day, which was ended up being a picket fence. So by the time the campaign was over, there was no picket fence in the whole place. But show you something about family in this room. By the way, how many of you are in the Baptist and how many of you are out of state? Indianapolis. Yeah, Indianapolis. You're in Indianapolis. Oh, we got locals. <laughs> <laughs> I want to show you some of the family. He had two children by his first wife. Her name was Caroline, and you saw her picture up on the wall as she walked in. And she has a, he has a son, and this is Russell over here. And then Russell had a wife, Mary. But there's so many Marys in this family, they call her me. Because he has a daughter, Mary. <laughs> and I give her her full married name, Mary Harrison McKee. That's much easier than calling her Mamie. And then Robert McKee, that's uh, her husband. I love that mustache. <laughs> <laughs> I love that mustache. And so uh, we have them here. Now, only one of them will have a, a son that will be a grandson to Benjamin Harrison, and that will be a daughter, Mary. So her, her son, Benjamin Harrison McKee, last name McKee. So there's nobody from Benjamin Harrison coming down, last name Harrison, but there are lots of them. So Harrison's will never die yet. We get somebody who comes to you all the time saying, I'm a relative of Benjamin Harrison. You go, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> who is it? Particularly if you come from Ohio, because lots of them. His law partner, by the way, was named William Henry Harrison McKee. I mean, William Henry Harrison Miller. And he was, of course, not a relative. He was from Ohio, because that name is very important here. OK. Remember in our picture here? See the gentleman above the fireplace? He's in our picture here. That's William Henry Harrison. That's Grandpa. His grandfather. And for years, we couldn't figure out where to put Grandma. She kept traveling from room to room. You go into one room, and there was Grandma on the wall. You get the next tour through, and the light in the, uh, the curator had moved her someplace else. Finally, he found a picture here. And here was Grandma on the wall. So, hooray, we finally got a place for Grandma. <laughs> 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 so we know this young woman here is Benjamin Harrison's second wife. The first Mrs. Harrison dies while he is in the White House in his last year. The man was devastated, as you can imagine, because he'd been married to her since 19. 
49 or something like this, and this is 1890 or thereabouts. So I mean, this is the woman of his heart. But he needed consolation, so he turned to his wife's social secretary, who was a member of the family, by the way. It was his wife's niece. And she gave him all the consolation he needed because she was a widow. So she knew exactly what he was going through. So after he left the White House, he came back here. And four years after uh, he left the White House, he married Mary. There's another Mary. <laughs> Mary Lord Mary's. Harrison. So I'll give her her full name. So, uh, and it turned out to be a very good marriage for the last four years of his life. And they had a daughter, Elizabeth. So since we're downstairs, not upstairs, I can't go in the picture of Elizabeth. Which is a pretty thing. Very, very charming young woman. We've got pictures of both of the, the women early in life. Here is Caroline at about age 18. See the difference in the ages? And here's Gary Lord at about the same age. She is only 60, I mean 38, when she marries Benjamin which is almost the same age as his daughter. So it caused a lot of problems, as you can imagine. But they were happy in this house, <laughs> very happy in this house. And if you had a batch of little children, I'd ask you, what do you do in a room like this? That's about it, yes, you know. But uh, Grandma's here. Yeah, you can take a picture of anything as long as it doesn't flash. Just painting is just If you're local, do you know Pleasant Run? Oh, yeah. Pleasant run. Over oh behind uh, Mandel High School or thereabouts in yeah. yeah. Harrison Park. The, who the is, ninth president. Her name is Anna Sims Harrison. That's William Henry's. And oh, there was almost a you might call a scandal involving these two. Uh, Anna Sims was all set to marry him. And William Henry's father died. William Henry's father wanted him to be a doctor. He wanted to be a soldier. So when his father died, he did exactly what he wanted to do. He joined the army. And her father asked him point blank, how are you going to support my daughter on the military pay? And he gave a very, very, very cheeky response, and that was with my good right arm. Uh, the story goes that he did not show up for the wedding. Another story is he showed up for the wedding and he walked out before the vows were said, but they made up later on. William Henry and Anna had ten children. Ten and he children. Got the land from his father in law in North Bend, Ohio, which is part of Cincinnati today. So I've got to send you off into the next room. We have to warn the general that you're coming. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is our oh, Regina phone. This is another thing. I love this thing. I mentioned dancing one day. They did. They turned it on and they started to dance. <laughs> this one is, uh, I think it's Beethoven. <laughs> American National Anthem, though. Stars Michael Bandit. Come on in, folks. We have plenty of space here in my library. That's the the Bible. Is the Bible? Yeah, it's an inaugural Bible. Nation's birthday, and it's certainly a pleasure to see all of you on this very important day where we celebrate our country's origin and world history and the importance of patriotism and the recognition that no country can long survive without acts of patriotism and service to country. And it's just great to see you here today. And I hope you're enjoying all of your activities. I wanna give with you, give with, give you a glimpse of the Harrison form of service to country and community. I'd like to draw your attention, first of all, to my great-grandfather, Benjamin Harrison V, that
that is depicted in that painting in the far right hand corner. He was one of the 56 signers to the Declaration of Independence. In the Second Continental Congress, his roommate was none other than the great George Washington. Can you imagine that as an experience? He became chairman of the Committee of the Whole that ultimately approved the final version of the Declaration of Independence that, with his recommendation, was approved on July 4th. He becomes the first human being in world history to read out loud in its entirety the final version of the Declaration of Independence. Can you imagine having that honor? The first human being to read it out loud. And then, during the American Revolution itself, he faced sacrifices and challenges like all of the signers to the Declaration of Independence did. You, I'm sure, have heard the name of Benedict Arnold, the greatest traitor against the American cause. When he turned coat and became a British Brigadier General, he led an army of 1,600 British soldiers, 1,600, straight to my great-grandfather's homestead just outside Richmond, Virginia, with the idea of capturing my great-grandfather and hanging him as a traitor. Fortunately, my family escaped, but Benedict Arnold did occupy my great-grandfather's home, destroying much of it. He also removed out of the homestead every single Harrison painting that could be found of any Harrison family member and destroyed them immediately, as if to wipe out of world history any reference whatsoever, in this case, to one of the signers to the Declaration of Independence. They even used my great-grandfather's cows that he was raising there on the farm for target practice. That's how nasty Benedict Arnold was. Well, I want to draw your attention to my grandfather that's above the fireplace here, depicted. He was the ninth president of the United States. Before that, he was Indiana's first territory, Indiana Territory governor. <coughs> now, the Indiana Territory back then included much of the Midwest, not just what became the state of Indiana. Did a great job there for many years. Became a war hero in the War of 1812. And then, of course, was elected president but only served a short period of time, as I'm sure you are aware of. Died in office, was not able to accomplish his vision of what he wanted to do. But he is known as one of only two presidents in America's history to have founded a university or college. One, of course, is Thomas Jefferson, who founded the great University of Virginia. The other one is my grandfather, who founded Vincennes University which continues today as one of the oldest continuously serving colleges in America's history. Only two presidents can make that claim. So he was a big proponent of education. Now in terms of my form of patriotism, yes, I was elected city attorney of the city of Indianapolis, elected United States Senator for the state of Indiana. I ran for governor of Indiana and lost in a close race. Clerk of the Supreme and Appellate Courts, private practicing attorney, but my greatest achievement, ladies and gentlemen, deals with the Civil War. Governor Oliver P. Morton asked me to recruit volunteers from all across the state of Indiana to join the Union Army in the fight to preserve our republic. I was so successful at doing that, they insisted that I actually join the Army, and I did. Went up through the ranks, fought in over 10 Civil War battles, and towards the end of the Civil War, one of my personal heroes, Abraham Lincoln, who was depicted in that painting, by the way, that painting that you see before you actually hung over the Lincoln casket when the Lincoln casket laid in state at the Indiana State Capitol Rotunda just a few blocks from here when thousands upon thousands of citizens lined up to pay their final regards to that fallen American patriot. He appointed me to the rank of Brigadier General, recognizing my service to the Union. And that's... I, what I consider to be my greatest achievement. If I get elected president, I will insist that folks call me general, not Mr. President, because I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it uh, took a lot more blood, sweat, and tear and sacrifice 
to fight in the Civil War, to fight in major Civil War battles and survive, than run a campaign and get elected president. So I uh, consider that to be the greatest honor uh, of my life, serving in the Civil War to preserve our great republic, to have subsequent generations of Americans to experience the blessings of freedom. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, many other people want to take the tour today, and I really enjoyed the opportunity to share this very special day for America. I wish all of your futures are going to be filled with success and happiness, and God bless America. Amen. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Great seeing all of you. Grandfather of William Henry Harrison. No. He actually died in the 30 days. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, welcome to Harrison's dining room. And all the furniture you see in here did belong to the Harrison's. Uh, of course, China did not actually belong to a down the street from the Harrison's. So the wedding in 1892. So, of course, here we go. The little high chair along the back wall belonged to Harrison's daughter, Elizabeth, the little daughter from the second marriage. And the left chef, Butter's Pantry, but they want to put all the food on the china plates and barbecue. Let's see, the House of Richmond just went here. But when he came back from the presidency as a widower, he needed more space. He wanted to live and cook and, and uh, made, and so he had to build on. And so he got built on up on the top, he got to build on down at the bottom too. So this was outside. You can even tell the difference in the you know, or the way that it's, it's, there's, there's a bathroom up there. In we go. And then, oh, also this used to be outside. And then we need an elevator so we could get people up and down or we couldn't become a museum. So that's why our windows are blocked off. Because people sometimes ask why we are, you know, that's the reason. If you look around on the outside, everything is so beautifully done out there, you really can't tell where the different, Construction, sir. Yeah. Come on into the kitchen. See, you got me again because I'm giving a break to somebody else. <laughs> but uh, do you remember I mentioned that Mrs. Harrison, the second Mrs. Harrison, didn't sell the house until she found somebody who would live up to the agreement? Well, since you're locals, you may know this individual that he sold, she sold, sold the house to. His name was Arthur Jordan. He wanted to start a music school. So he bought the two houses next to us, and he bought this one, and this would be his, you might call his administration house. And you know Arthur Jordan because Jordan School of Music Butler University. This is where it started. And wow. Mr. Uh, Jordan just absolutely loved this house. He got a lot of the furniture when he built the, when he bought the house. It was up in the third floor ballroom. And he could bring it down, he could put it in the room, so a lot of the things you saw there, actually in the in the front parlor, those beautiful chairs in front of the fireplace, he loved those. He used them as his office chairs, so they got so well worn, we really had to finish them off. Now, we don't have little tiny ones here, so we don't have to explain what a few of the things in this room are. But uh, everybody loves our two things in this place. One is the icebox. And I didn't even know her flow because here and then down into there, and it's actually under there, but I've never gotten under there. And we, we can touch parts of this, but not everything. Yeah. And of course, the children are always surprised to find out that this is all your space you got for your food. <laughs> but that's the way it was, you know. One of my favorite things when I did school children, I used to ask them, how much ice do I want to order today? Now, adults always make it complicated. They do not go right to the, to the heart of the thing and say, okay, what can I see clearly? 50. 50 pounds, there we go. When I was growing up in the 1940s, neighbors across the street, she got ice. She had chickens as well. And so you'd, you'd see the ice man come in this case, not with his wagon, but he came with his truck. 
and unloaded his ice using the tongs and all of that. So uh, I'm not, we're not that far back, but still a lot of people got ice and were taken out, broken up, and burnt as kindling wood because nobody were here for Christmas because she had absolutely everything she needed all in one place. Oh, we do have a, a high chair over in the corner. This is Baby McKee's high chair. Benjamin Harrison McKee's high chair. And it's in this corner. I don't know why in this particular one, but it is. And it's I've been told it's one of the best examples of bent wood that there is. And we know it's his because the tray here is his christening tray. So it's got his engraved on there and what his dates of birth are and everything else along the line. Our pump, they say, used to work. But the plumbing in this, I mean, the, with all the tree roots and everything, this place has had plumbing problems from day one. And we have all of Harrison's plumbing bills, so we know it. You can, I don't think he threw a thing away like that, so we've got them. So I'm told at one time it did work. What you normally did with this dry sink, as it's called, would go through there, you'd plumb it out through the wall. And then it would then it would uh, water all the plants or anything else you had in front. You don't want to waste the water there, of course. And then Mrs. Harrison loved uh, birds, so we got our case up there. How many of you remember these from grade school? Your hand towel. Of course, if you're my age, you do. You washed your hands, you dried it, you pulled it down, and you just hope that by the time the last person got up there, they found a dry spot to write. Because this is a heck of a lot different than blowers and, and paper towels today. So, and then we have our cast iron stove here. It's a wood burning one. And so this is where the, uh, the ash would collect and then we clean it out. The pipe oven up here, this is for heating your water. Now he did eventually have, when he, put, when he uh, added on to the house, he put in a gravity tank in the attic, so he did have water. Outside that, I think the cistern was out underneath that originally when you did the washing up and everything else, right through there. And I think most of you may know the term putting things on the back burner. This is the back burner because it's the, it is the uh, coolest burner in the entire place. So if you wanted things to go real slow, that's where you put them. The hottest stuff is up here, and you work your way around and do there. This is an adult thing, a grocery list. Hey, New Jersey, 1891. It's got high-end meat market things, tongue, lamb chops, steak, all kinds of stuff. The price is $8.01. Cheap. One of our, our young men who does the school's children's classes went out a couple years ago, and this is a couple years ago, and priced everything out. At that time, it was $275. So you can imagine what it is now with the way the increase in all the prices and things like that. Iron, it's a steam iron. iron. To it. It's a steam iron. I don't really know how you use it exactly. I think I put coals inside somehow, and then it builds up the steam, which then creates a, what to put. And then some people think this is a Pasta maker, it is, and it's for ruffles. Huh. Yeah. So, yeah, and this is another little iron here, just use this way. And of course, if you want to pick up a sad iron, you can. Somebody said they're called sad irons because you pick them up and they're sad, or they have to use them. They've got the weight on them here. This is a, I think, a six pound, this is a seven. It says here about, about drinking and everything, and the swallow will always remain. <laughs> so if you're tall enough like him, you can see that. <laughs> and our director, who's this very tall young man, but the rest of us can't see it, so. Thank you for coming. I'll let you Thank out you. the back door. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping to have a reasonably good time with this heat. Oh, it's <laughs> yeah. Well, it's really cool.
and my glasses steam up. That shows you the chat. <laughs> <laughs> what it's like out there. That's oh man, we have to go upstairs, bro. Goal zero. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. I forgot. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. Isn't that beautiful? That's where his money went in. This house cost him $25,000 to build. This is the back stair, but look how beautiful it is. Yeah. Wow. wow. Do you have any tours upstairs? Uh, uh, Man. Nice. So, Dad. That's pretty cool, huh? What do you think? It's cool, man. I like it. It's really old, huh? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So, what should we do next? Um... It's two thirty nine. We have we have like two hours left. What do you want to do? Uh, I don't know. Should we go hang out? To where? I uh, mean, it's just this area. Yeah, look around. There's a bunch of stuff to do. Declarations of Independence. That is awesome, dude. Yeah, right. You're welcome to sign. The declaration, be careful where you put your hand down. A lot of the ink is still wet. And you just have to take the cap off the ink so we're keeping it covered so it doesn't dry out. Oh.